uh, this lunchtime um, lecture on ethics and accreditation of engineering education. My name is Damien Owens, Registrar in Engineers Ireland, and I'm joined by Dr. Catherine Deegan from TU Dublin and Dr. Diana Martin from Eindhoven University of Technology. Our presentation today will take about 20 minutes. This is uh, another in a series of webinars on the topic of our accreditation criteria. Uh, please note that these presentations are recorded and available for later reference. And I would stress that the, it's only the presentation that's recorded. The questions and answer session at the end is not recorded. Uh, the, mic, uh, the recording is off for that, so we can have a, a discussion. There have been two previous webinars, and uh, they are available on the Engine Journal website. And today's topic is uh, Program Outcome 5, which looking in more detail at the professional and ethical responsibilities uh, and how they are delivered and assessed in uh, engineering education. So I will start with a, for about 20 minutes, give an overview of the Engineers Ireland perspective and our experience. And uh, I think there'll be followed some very powerful examples, I think from Catherine and Diana afterwards. And then we will leave questions to the end. Just a reminder that when you're asked questions, please use the Q&A button. Uh, it's on the bottom of my screen, but it could be at the top of yours or on the side. Uh, do not use the chat box. Um, so the, the, the Q&A button is the place to go. So if we consider engineering ethics, uh, the definition of ethics is, is quite complex. It can be based on rules of recognized uh, uh, of human actions, moral principles, uh, a system of principles, a branch of philosophy. So even the definition itself of the word is, is fairly complex. And I think therein uh, is a, an appropriate way to start our journey to discuss how we, we deliver and evaluate ethics. So looking at the accreditation process, today we're going to look at, I suppose, the delivery and evaluation of ethics from the perspective of educators, but also from the perspective of uh, evaluators seeking to, to, to look for evidence. So accreditation is a periodic assessment of engineering programs and higher education institutes to ensure the management of the delivery of programs and the achievement of a threshold of learning outcome by students. And what we mean by a threshold is the students have to demonstrate that you've achieved these learning outcomes across a range of areas. Uh, it, it, we are not concerned how well they achieve. In other words, once you achieve a threshold, that's fine. And the process comprises a review panel uh, of academic and industry members and external evaluators at times. And they go on site uh, for a two day visit uh, to evaluate evidence as part of uh, an accreditation process. And the process itself, just keeping with the theme of today of, of ethics and uh, social responsibility, the process itself is confidential. Material submitted by the HGI for evaluation can be redacted. So for example, material might just have lecturer one, lecturer two, may not have their names. Um, any comments from students, graduates, and employers uh, uh, who we interview during part of the process are anonymized. So we do give feedback to the HEI, but the, the comments are anonymized. And the review team meetings are held in Canberra. So they're held in private uh, uh, from time to time, and they discuss uh, their own findings. Uh, and no, uh, there are no external observers uh, at those meetings. Uh, all material is deleted at the end of the process. So once, once the accreditation decision is final, that's it. Just, uh, uh, all, all evidence is, is securely destroyed. There's limited publication results, so we do not put the reports on the websites, or, or uh, though the, the, the HI is, is clear to do it with its report as it wishes. Uh, and where the process is online, which is increasingly the case, and we'll come to that later, there's no recording of the process. So it's entirely, I suppose, it's, it's real time, but online and not recorded. So we look at the formation of a professional engineer or a chartered engineer. Uh, it commences with academic education. Then afterwards, a period of initial professional development where the, the academic uh, learnings are applied in the workplace setting. And then a professional assessment by, by peers, by other engineers. And then a period of lifelong learning. So learning just doesn't stop when the, the graduate leaves the college gates. And from an ethics perspective, in the academic environment, uh, it's education and assessment of, of, of the ethics and social context. Um, however, it's not possible to um, uh, teach everything about every possible environment where an engineer potentially can, 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 can end up working in the academic environment. So uh, 
following on from that, the professional organization will then evaluate the, uh, the engineers or the graduates work initial professional development in a real world setting. It'll be peer assessed at a professional interview. And then that, that learning will go on and be continuously assessed through CPD uh, declarations. The engineering accreditation criteria uh, have been in place since 1982 and they get revised every number of years. Um, they are they are devised uh, and set up by the uh, and approved by the accreditation board in engineers Ireland, Ireland, and they are reflective of uh, international standards in engineering education. So they reflect um, what is required across academia and by industry on a globe in a global context. And the latest version of the criteria um, were launched in January 2021, um, and they're gradually being introduced for uh, HEIs presenting programs for accreditation from this year onwards. So uh, the old criteria are still in place for some, some evaluations that are currently ongoing. So the, the new criteria represent a series of incremental changes. Um, there's, uh, the emphasis remains on program outcomes. There's a new program outcome eight on engineering management and there'll be a, a later uh, a webinar event on that. And uh, there's new program area number seven on sustainability, again, reflecting the, 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 the current environments. Uh, and the program management section has been reorganized and amplified. And that document is available online and it's, it's free to download. And I, I recommend that you, uh, you download it and, and, and look through it. So focusing on program outcome five, which is professional and ethical responsibilities. And here we require graduates and students have an understanding and commitment, an understanding of and commitment to the professional and ethical responsibilities towards people and the environment in the practice of engineering. And you know, that, is, that is quite a tall order. It covers a, quite a range of, of areas if we look into it. Uh, and indicative graduate attributes include an understanding and appreciation of the environmental, social and economic impacts of their work. So engineers and graduates need to understand how the work they do uh, and design impacts in the wider uh, societal community. And uh, an importance of where the engineer fits in in, in in society and also within their workplace setting. So uh, the, the role of the engineer would be radically different if they're one of a large team of engineers working in a large corporation, or if they're the only engineer working in this, uh, an SME where they're solely responsible for detecting the role and interfacing, say, with, with the accountant or the HR manager. So it's, it's, a lot of this is driven by, uh, I suppose, an appreciation of the context in which the engineer is working. Uh, a knowledge and understanding of importance of equality, diversity and inclusion, uh, commitment to ongoing ethical usage of technology and data, and health and safety and cult cultural and risk issues. So we'll expand on those in, in the next slides. So for initially some feedback from accreditation visits. Uh, I suppose the first is that the interpretation of ethics is generally loosely interpreted. Um, students recall of ethics is usually, uh, when we ask in interviews, it's usually confined to, oh, it's plagiarism. And, you know, I'm, I have to uh, uh, sign off that uh, my work is, is my own. And I think there's a, there's a case of, people not seeing the wood for the trees, they don't really realize the bigger impact or the bigger uh, relevance of, of what's going on in terms of um, health and safety uh, criteria, waste directives, um, security. They're all aspects of their work that impact on society, that will impact on, 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 on the work they do. So it's, it's looking at a much more holistic picture of what ethics and social responsibility is. Uh, therefore, in that context, teaching ethics as a module in itself, uh, Ethics 101, is, is quite ineffective. You can't really compartmentalize it, and it really needs to be spread across all modules. Uh, and college policies may, do, may not be adequately explained or understood by students. Again, health and safety policies, plagiarism is generally understood, but health and safety, you know, waste, use, reuse, uh, and there are policies that all the, the, the colleges would have in place, but again, the, 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 the students may not be aware or, or, or know they're there, but not recognize they're important in the context. 
And uh, academic staff and evaluation teams in general do have difficulty in interpreting and evaluating ethics. So why is it so difficult? Well, let's first of all look at the language uh, in Programme Outcome 5. Judgment, principle, role, commitment. Uh, they're all very, uh, I suppose, nebulous terms. Uh, and engineers don't really like that. Engineers like you know, finite, well-defined um, terminology. So, uh, and words like commitment is something into the future, generally. I commit to do something into the future. So measure that now, very difficult to do. Uh, there are very few boundaries. There's always, but the what if, uh, what happens if I do this? What happens if I do that? It's open to personal interpretation. There is no right answer. Probably at least at least wrong answer might be more appropriate in some circumstances. There's a cultural context. Um, and you will see this with students in the class. Uh, if they come from different cultural uh, backgrounds, they may have a totally different interpretation as, as what is acceptable or not in their particular culture. But equally, the engineers for training uh, can work anywhere around the globe. So again, they have to have this self-awareness of their uh, their own cultural bias if they go to work in a different in a different environment. And it's also based on individual interpretation and the level of responsibility of that person in that role at that time in that organisation. So it's 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 multi-dependent. And just to make things even more complicated, is that the interpretation of program outcome five actually spans the other program outcomes that we evaluate. So for example, um, if we're looking at a uh, program outcome on design, um, we we'll say, okay, how does that design fit in in delivering for, uh, is it dangerous? Does it, does it look at all the, the, the say, the, the requirements of the, the UN SDGs? So everything, it's, it's interdependent and feeds back into um, uh, how the engineer views things through, through uh, program outcome five. And this is a, a, I suppose, this tabulates the program outcomes at various education levels for engineering technician, associate engineer, and chartered engineer for the learning and chartered engineer. And we can see, say, on knowledge that the, the depth of learning and knowledge changes uh, and increases as you move from left to right. However, if you come to the highlighted section number five, PO5, the text is identical all the way across. And again, just highlights that it's really the context in which the individual operates uh, that sets uh, the, uh, the, the level of awareness uh, and learning. So how do we actually improve awareness in the classroom? How can we, uh, I suppose, uh, make the students aware of their responsibilities and how to demonstrate that learning? Well, first of all, we have to provide awareness of the broad spectrum of ethical, social, environmental context. So it's looking at, for example, you know, um, codes of use, Euro codes, uh, we directive, health and safety, environmental issues. And it's making students aware that all of that feeds into the, the ethics and responsibility equation. So it's not just it's not just um, a, a narrow a narrow spectrum. You've got to widen it out. Uh, another a very powerful way to do this is using case studies. Um, uh, and unfortunately, the case studies I usually focus on when things go horribly wrong, uh, like bridges falling down or or you know um, the space shuttle disaster, software malfunctioning. So there, there are many um, cases, unfortunately, in every discipline of engineering, but to provide very powerful learning opportunities um, to impart to students. And also ex they explain the reasons for ethical failures, which can be uh, uh, excess, I suppose, uh, confidence in your design. Um, peer review designs are probably better uh, than just having a, a, a single engineer design uh, Going into the going into the real world application, real world projects, for example, are, again offer a rich environment for um, uh, improving awareness, like work placements, community projects, and health and safety briefings. Uh, provide, uh, I suppose, a rich opportunity to again impart the knowledge to students and make them aware. And the key thing is they're being aware of the importance. We can not see the wood for the trees because we're so engrossed in the situation. But if we can remove ourselves slightly, we can see the, uh, I suppose, the, the, the impact. Um, and then 
a key a key part of this is to impart students that evaluation of their work uh, and their health and safety work and uh, ethical work in a in an academic environment is safe. Unfortunately, the real world can be brutal. It may be evaluated by a senior counsel in a court uh, if something goes horribly wrong. So it's again, you know, getting students to to feel safe and to be able to explore and give their interpretation of what they think is safe or otherwise or acceptable or otherwise in the context in, in a safe academic uh, environment. It makes students aware then of that their obligations in these areas and their scope in these areas will greatly increase after graduation. One of the challenges we have as assessors uh, undertaking um, accreditation visits is, is looking uh, uh, for the evidence and evaluating the evidence. And very often, uh, the evidence can be hiding in plain sight. Uh, we frequently would, would undertake visits, uh, and it's only when we've spoken to people uh, they realize that there's a wealth of material there, but it's just not bubbling to the surface or being captured. Uh, student practical projects in particular are a rich source of evidence, and uh, many projects with, with artifacts um, are, are, are recorded, uh, and, and th th those video recordings are a rich source of evidence. Uh, such as a um, presentation, for example. Work placement reports, again, provide ample evidence of the student in a real world setting and how they are operating that setting and how they are contextualizing uh, their, their work. Uh, projects or dissertations, especially in the final year, really should have a, a very brief section, a, a, a very incised project, but dedicated to the student explaining the broader context of the setting of their academic work and what the impacts uh, security, health and safety, whatever, of the workers in, 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 in that context. And there should be active um, uh, encouragement at all stages to get students to articulate their views on these topics. Many students will be, be uncomfortable, but they will lose that. Uh, uh, they become more comfortable with more and more practice. Uh, but the important thing from a, a, a HEI perspective is capture and record the evidence. The evidence is there. Uh, but you know, if you don't record a presentation, once it's given, it's gone. So uh, be sure to capture it and keep it for the accreditation visit. It makes the work of the review team, the evaluation team, so much easier. Uh, we undertook a, a, a survey a number of years ago, and you can see that engineers uh, is looking at the, the public trust uh, and the truthfulness of various professions. And doctors were number one, but engineers were very close behind, a percentage point or two behind, in terms of trust uh, placed in them by the general public. So this is a survey of the general public. And we, we need to maintain that trust. And we need to educate, I suppose, our, our, our students and our engineers in the workplace that you know, trust is very important uh, and needs to be, you know, we need to work hard to maintain it. Uh, well, and one failure, in that uh, it can cause, you know, uh, irreparable um, reputational damage. In technology, you know, uh, we, we tend to look for certainty. And at the start, many new technologies may look promising. If we took, take, for example, something like artificial intelligence, um, it, it can really look promising at the start. And it can deliver something that's very beneficial. So here we have a, a pop. That pup can go up to be a, a dog here. That's a great benefit in helping us. On the other hand, it can grow up to be an adversary. But we don't know that at the start. And that is the exact same for many of the nascent and new technologies that we are working with. So students are working in artificial intelligence uh, and new areas of development, biomedical, whatever. Uh, and you know what looks like a good idea, we don't know how it's going to pan out. And we have to step back and be very, I suppose, uh, objective in our view uh, that, you know, uh, that what we're introducing is for the general benefit of humanity uh, and sustainability and that we're not inadvertently introducing to tomorrow's next problem that we're going to have to mop up and solve afterwards. In a professional context, Engineers Ireland has a code of ethics, uh, which members are bound to adhere to. And, you know, at a very, I suppose, uh, mundane level, it sets out, you know, contractual obligations between engineers and, and their clients. 
but equally it moves on toward the areas which is conflict of interest, but also uh, a requirement at all times to act in the common good, the advancement of human welfare, which is a, a very um, a very big area, a, a very strong commitment. And there's an obligation um, of engineers to inform engineers earlier if there's any suspicion of a breach of the code of ethics by another member. And I frequently would get calls from engineers who were working on a project and they're being asked to do something which they're not comfortable with or asked to sign off something which they know uh, in their heart and soul, this is, this is not a good idea. And you know they ring for advice and, and check things out. So um, you know there, there is an obligation to engineers to behave with that integrity, and they do. And I think that is why the public trust is so high. So we need to maintain that, and it's maintained in this instance through a code of ethics. So in summary, edu ethics education can't really be compartmentalized. We have to have a, a broad spectrum of delivery, considering the range of implications of engineers' actions in the workplace, uh, not just from a technology perspective, but from an environmental perspective, sustainability perspective, and the impact on society at large. At the same time, ethics does have a cultural context, and that depends you know, where the engineer is operating, the environment, and our level of responsibility. And students to be educated to reflect on the real world broader implications of their work. It's a safe environment in the classroom, but they need to be able to explore, I suppose, step outside of themselves and look at their own actions, education, uh, 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 impartially and say, well, am I doing the best thing here? Uh, I suppose the bit of advice to educators, please capture that evidence. It makes the review teams work much easier. And don't forget, though you may be an educator, you will probably be on the review team at some point. So what would you like to see if, if, uh, if you go on a visit? simply provide that to the review team and to come to you. And the code of ethics from a professional organization really does help after graduation along life, alongside lifelong learning. So I will end it there and hand over um, to the next speaker, Catherine Deegan from, from TU Dublin. So thanks um, Damien and Richard for having me along to speak today. And it's very good to be present to share experiences with this. I've been involved in accreditation of engineering programmes for over 10 years now, I think closer to 15, and in the school I'm currently working in, in Kevin Street, we were just completing our submissions for the accreditation of four programmes in one go, um, just over a year ago to the day, when the pandemic and national lockdown that we're all uh, engaged in at the moment hit. So it was less a gentle segue and more a sharp turn, or as the uh, phrase is being used now, a pivot to online and remote operations that we're all still very much engaged in. So what I'm going to cover today is evaluating the ethics from the perspective of a project manager leading a, a fairly large accreditation project in a school um, under in, in an online scenario, because we, we led those programs through that accreditation process last year. So online, so as I said, this time last year, it, it, this week, we were due to have the on-site visit that is the norm for the accreditation processes. We had, we were just drawing to a close on producing our documentation, maintaining our program outcome, learning outcome analysis that Damien was referring to um, earlier. And that we were getting ready and that's normally submitted in advance. There's a small gap and then there is um, an on-site meeting uh, process. Of course, with the lockdown and everything in place, then we had to move very quickly to an online process. Now, what was done, and in, I have to say engineers Learn were great in supporting us in this, is that we had to move then to face-to-face -face meetings, considering our documentation, and then move to an evidence provision process, which, as Damien has put a lot of emphasis on this, to organise this via a secure online process, to, to have everything digitised and put into online folders for presentation to the panels. And we had two separate panels for our four programmes. So the, I'm going to talk a little bit about that process because it did in actual fact facilitate the process very well and particularly for the ethics piece because that is traditionally I think anyone involved in accreditation process it is a challenging process for us as engineers and certainly going through the processes in the traditional face-to-face -face before it would have been something that we would have always found challenging in the past 
it's identifying it first and then finding it and producing it in a way that is accessible for panels to evaluate would have been our chief uh, challenges before uh, in, in going through this. But in producing it, it's probably best presented graphically as much as possible. I guess one of the advantages of doing I think, four programs at once is there were approximately 150 modules to examine. And the modules were assessed individually in terms of program outcome and learning outcomes for the Engineers Ireland program outcomes. Each of these were assessed individually. And because there were so many to manage, we were using an online, a shared folder of process using uh, Microsoft OneDrive in any case. And these were all allotted to their individual program folders. So we had that set up anyway in advance of actually having to do so. So these were all done individually. And we produced what should be a fairly familiar looking heat map at this stage for anyone who's done this process before. Once we had those heat maps and, and had them all arranged, then when it came to evidence uh, provision and evidence presentation, in consultation with Engineers Ireland, we set up a, a, an evidence folder for each programme, organised by year, and then set up what I think is a key piece for any evidence, which is an evidence index. And basically by year stage, the strong contributors basically by program outcomes. So for the ethics piece, which is what we're discussing in today's webinar, the modules that would have contributed that we could see from the heat map that had contributed very well for the high ethical standards piece would have been listed, the lecture, the assessment methods, evidence provided and the most relevant sections with then dynamic links then from the exam material and to assessment materials. And these were then linked then to the folders individually and the pieces saved by the lecturers. This process set up, it took quite a while to set up, but I have to say it was one of the best, I would say, improvements in a process that, and it replaced the evidence room that we would have had uh, uh, preceding uh, the pandemic. And it is certainly something I think we would hold on to uh, moving, you know, once we all get back into our, our workplaces and go, go back to face to face. With regard to the ethics piece, I was collecting over the last year um, and over the years staff perspectives on the whole ethics piece. As Damien said about engineers, we like to be definite and we like to be, be clear. And these would be some of the things that, that would have come back on staff. I had oversight of the entire project and of all the modules that were being looked at. And one thing that the online process facilitated was the examination of scoring, the individual scoring and across programs and across years of programs as they were coming in. So there was a dialogue process. So I could speak to program leads, I could speak to year tutors and I could speak to program coordinators as to what programs were looking like as they came in and query things like, for example, work placement modules, um, final year projects things that I would expect where ethics would come up. Um, and these are the types of things that might come back from some staff uh, when we query, say, you know, yes, expect to see some ethics content there. Can you talk through maybe your scoring or your thoughts on that? One of the most uh, interesting comments that came back would be centrally highlighted in red there. And um, this is a lecturer who produced uh, material and teaches in such a way that I would say exemplify ethical, uh, both in terms of content and how and why they teach. But it was a really funny comment to come back. It's not ethics, it's just what I do. Now, this, I guess, is what we'd like to see. It's an example of ethics being embedded in a program rather than being um, compartmentalized or siloed into one module. However, one of the issues with that then is it was so embedded, the lecturers themselves didn't recognize it for what it was. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. And I think, Damien, it's being recognized by Engineers Ireland and by panels is that sometimes it's so embedded and it's so there, it's, it's hiding in plain sight and people can't extract it for what it is. In other cases, it's a case that um, some staff are a little bit shy and a little bit tentative about saying that, well, I teach ethical content because they don't have the title of an ethics lecturer. Or they don't have professional qualifications that are you know, ethics, ethics related. In other cases, I said they're not comfortable because it's not explicitly stated in their module learning outcomes, because we have a very explicit process for mapping module and program learning outcomes, which, you know, is something I would look at when we're going to do this process again. Some do feel it should be a separate 
subject. Again, the specialist qualifications to teach it would be a feature for some people. And another thing is, what exactly do we mean by it? And we've already, you know, had this presented by Damien. It is something that is, it can be considered a little woolly around the edges for some. So it, it, there is definitely an information piece and, and uh, an education piece around this. I think that is important. So this is something and something I was really happy to see in the new criteria was the mention of data and data management in under the ethics piece. Uh, Jean Baudrillard was a French sociologist and this is in a book he published in 1981 and it preceded the internet era before the internet really was really in anyone's consciousness at the time. It's a quote that's used a lot uh, around the recent era of fake news and uh, the current digital media, but he was talking at the time of the print media and the proliferation of gossip and, and you know, uh, false stories going around about people. However, I think this is important to, to think about in, in terms of what we're doing now. And one thing I would see that one of the biggest ethical issues that I think all of our students, regardless of their specific engineering discipline or any discipline, need to be aware of. And that is how we handle information and how we handle data. So I guess particularly in my own area, but in any area, how we handle people's information, including how we handle our students' information is a very important thing. So anyone embarking on um, an online process where they're handling lots of students' evidence and, and data, it is an important consideration to be aware of. And we certainly were very mindful of it going through our own process. And it's something that students need to be aware of that we were, and consequently that they take that into their own workplaces. The observations on the online process, definitely it improved efficiency and oversight. Uh, it really did Im improve how we did things, how efficient they were and how checking procedures were done. I felt there was a lot less running around and checking. The, the material was there to be checked and double checked when, when I needed it. Um, oversight in terms of program chairs could look at material and then members of the school exec and then the project manager myself could look and meet and check it. So there were less gaps, I, I feel, in the information and certainly in the evidence. Accessibility for the programs teams and the evaluation panels both. I was very fortunate in our final meetings that the panels met me on my own for some time and gave me feedback on the actual process. They were very, very generous in their feedback. And they felt it worked very well in terms of the quantity and the quality of information available through the online process. So that was really helpful. Um, a consistency of analysis approach and presentation of evidence, particularly when we have a, a big group of programs being evaluated. Consistency of approach, I think, is very important. And the clarity of your approach is very important for panels. As Damien said, really, the days of panels being in a room with a ton of paper in boxes, trying to um, mine the evidence out really should be passed us now. Given that they have a well-labeled uh, index and information um, filed correctly, there should be no need for that. And it should be, the time should be better spent evaluating the evidence that's correctly placed rather than looking for it in the first place. And that is particularly important for ethics because as Damien said, it is very spread out. It can be, feel quite sparse, but I found I was quite gratified how much of it actually arrived when it was all put together. It, it looks sparse, but then when it's put together for each program, there's a sizable amount of it there. Um, data protection and security is very straightforward. We used OneDrive and the Microsoft system. It's what our institution uses. And it was very easy for me as project manager to have oversight of who had access to what folder and when, when they were accessing it and it, what type of access they had, whether it was just reading access, writing access, et cetera. That is very important. It's student data and we could anonymize, but it, sometimes we couldn't. So it's very important that we can do that and have the appropriate permissions. Although all these types of things are increasingly important now since the GDPR legislation, even without legislation, it is an ethical matter. Um, important points to note, uh, you should approach online as a separate one stage process. I think we've learned a lot a year later, but I, I think when we started into this, there was an effort with online processes to uh, do an exact replication of what our face to face process was. And that doesn't always work. Online is just a different environment and we just embrace what it can do for us and let go of what we can't do online. Um, it does require a lot of advanced planning and can be a little more time consuming in the planning, but it is work that is well worth doing for the benefits that it brings to you that I've, I've set out. 
Um, but I would say, based on the quote earlier, avoid including everything as evidence. And the headings that we were given by Engineers Ireland for the evidence index were very helpful for that. Um, doing a data dump is no better than providing a big room full of boxes of paper for a, a review panel to have to mine through. It's far better to be give considered pieces and good samples of evidence than just, uh, I still produced, it was four gigabytes of, of data evidence for four programs, which I was quite horrified at. But you know, evidence, you know, you can have sizable amounts of data. Be sure every piece that's in there is relevant, that it should be there. Going back to the data protection and security, it should only be there if it needs to be there for the purposes of the accreditation, not just because you can. Um, and finally, and this is actually an important point, um, sites, facilities and visit are not included and a social aspect is lost. lost. You can do videos, you can do walkthroughs. It's not as good as the real thing. And there are elements of that that are lost. Um, just last week, I packed up my office for the final time in Kevin Street on our old campus. And I, I really had in mind my father studying there in 1957 when all he had was a pen and paper to record anything and roll calls were done uh, on roll sheets. Uh, at the, and these were still used in the 70s and 80s. And we did find these actually in Kevin Street and they were packed away for our archives. And um, now we're all, uh, it, it moved to floppy disks in the 90s and now we're all um, on working on the cloud as we are now. We're moving to our new campus in Grange Gorman shortly. The keys were handed over uh, just over a week ago. And we are really looking forward to being back on campus and being in a state-of-the-art facility and showing off where we work. We're made to work together face-to-face -to -face in buildings. Um, as much as I would be evangelical about the online process, how it facilitated evidence preparation, presentation and analysis. Um, how it streamlined the process, made it more straightforward, and I'd hang on to it. I would not like to lose the face-to-face -face elements. Uh, we are social beings, and I think that is a really, really important part of, of what we do. So just a quick summary there. I won't go through it in detail, but it definitely the online process did facilitate the ethical part of it. And I will just finish up with thanking everyone. Thanks, Richard and Damien, and I'm happy to introduce Diana Martin, who is coming up after me there uh, with our presentation. Um, thank you. Thank you, Richard and Damien, for the invitation. My name is uh, Diana Martin, and I am based at uh, TU Eindhoven currently. But today I will be presenting findings of my doctoral research study, which was conducted at TU Dublin on the education of engineering ethics in the context of accreditation. And I want to thank the 23 engineering programs that took part in the study and also to the individual lecturers and evaluators, some of you who I've uh, seen in the participants uh, list. Reflecting on what findings can be more relevant for today's discussion, I stopped at some common challenges in connection with ethics uh, encountered in the stages of the accreditation process. And ethics has been highlighted as the hardest outcome to evaluate, but also to prepare evidence for uh, prior to the accreditation process. And we, if we are considering the pre-visit stage, uh, which consists of a self-assessment of program outcomes and also a preparation and organization of evidence, two common questions that uh, have been mentioned are how to account for the presence of ethics and also what counts as coverage of ethics. And uh, this preparation of uh, the program team also reflects and impacts on the experience that evaluators have during the visit stage when they have to review program evidence and uh, also when preparing the report with recommendations. And some of uh, the aspects uh, that are being considered here are where to look for evidence in support of ethics, what counts as coverage of ethics, and how to formulate recommendations that would help operationalize the outcome within the institution. For today, I am focusing on the pre-visit stage, given uh, that, uh, as I said, it uh, reflects uh, common concerns with those of the um, evaluators. And uh, a very powerful strategy for this pre-visit stage is about the development of the so-called POLO rubric by which a program maps how each of their modules 
meets each of the program outcomes set by the accrediting body with a numerical score. Although uh, there have been uh, various ways in which this uh, polar rubric have been interpreted also in terms of ECTS or percentage contribution, but the recommended um, strategy is uh, that of a numerical self-assessment. And this rubric has been described by evaluators as a powerful tool for uh, identifying how each course contributes to the accreditation requirement and of seeing where uh, ethics might appear in the program. But it has also been described as a messy rubric and uh, there have been challenges in ensuring consistency and accur accuracy in the criteria for scoring with uh, different institutions uh, um, employing different strategies when uh, deciding on a score. And um, one, uh, one um, other uh, aspect uh, uh, falling here in the consistency um, is uh, that of uh, the same module with the same content or the same instructor receiving a different numerical scores, scores in the documentation submitted for accreditation that has been identified as, uh, by the evaluators as a need for a coordinated approach when, uh, when um, establishing the scores at program level and also uh, within the same institution. And um, here there is uh, the risk of uh, <coughs> overscoring and also underscoring. And uh, sometimes uh, sub outcomes uh, under each um, course tend to be averaged. And this is a major uh, um, cause of uh, underscoring. <coughs> Apologies. In the evaluator's uh, experience, um, as I said, uh, uh, this uh, this uh, rubric was highlighted uh, as uh, a powerful tool and uh, it said that the programs that understand how to use this rubric best would also emphasize the evidence that is hard to find. And this means also uh, not having a uniform uh, scores by which every course scores four or zero, but uh, there is an entire in a way, pa palette of uh, numerical scores that uh, uh, that are meant to represent the profile of uh, of uh, the specific course and uh, as it said there is some overestimation and underestimation of uh, the contribution uh, that uh, has been highlighted as a need for a greater rigor and consistency and objectivity in self assessment and uh, this is where uh, it's important to have one person or a team uh, that oversees this process of um, self-assessment and the uh, unique and also challenging role of the program uh, chair of the unit leader in explaining to teaching staff what topics and learning outcomes fall under the scope of ethics and also to check for consistency between the polo scores, the course uh, material, and also the evidence in support of ethics and how they fit the reality of teaching practice. And sometimes these uh, individuals are uniquely positioned and they know uh, the program best and uh, the contribution of uh, uh, the modules best, uh, having that sort of helicopter view. And when it comes uh, to ethics, um, there is uh, um, the risk uh, of underscoring when uh, um, having a narrower understanding of what ethics is. So if we consider that ethics is not, uh, ethics is only about ethical theories of academic misconduct, many other areas that uh, should fall under this uh, uh, program outcome would be missed. And those that tend to be overlooked in this process are uh, safety labs, uh, uh, sustainability content and also policies, policy issues, including uh, standards, as well as um, societal and stakeholder consideration. So this, uh, this uh, suggests a, uh, the need for a broader understanding of uh, ethics. At the same time, there is also the risk of overscoring when, um, um, so based on let's say an example, uh, during an during a observation of an accreditation visit when mathematical calculations relevant to ensuring safety of processes were, um, were considered to sufficiently um, 
to sufficiently explain a score of four for a module without explicitly addressing safety or uh, or um, inviting students to reflect on what is at stake or what are uh, the real life implications of those mathematical calculation. So in a way, safety appears as the most challenging uh, topic uh, and uh, it leads both to underscoring and overscoring. And uh, as, uh, as mentioned um, earlier about the broad palette for understanding what falls under this outcome, and also picking up for, uh, from Damien's point that uh, the interpretation of uh, the outcome purporting to ethics spans other program outcomes, uh, we can see that uh, we can uh, have an understanding of uh, ethics across uh, all criteria. And if we think uh, that uh, ethics can be understood as sustainability, as uh, risk and safety, as legislation, as professional conduct, as uh, finance and business topics in its societal dimension, as responsibility, as value sensitive design, as plagiarism, as ethical theories, and as community service, we can see that this, uh, these understandings overlap with uh, some of um, the topics that might fall under design or under the new, newly introduced uh, professional outcome. And in a way, this, uh, this uh, naturally will lead to an implementation of ethics across uh, the curriculum. And uh, just uh, looking at, um, at the Apollo scores, uh, for uh, the participant programs um, and in connection with ethics, Apollo scores uh, except zero, we can see that we could already talk about a comprehensive uh, implementation of uh, ethics in engineering programs, more or less explicit. It is um, less explicit when it comes to the presence of ethics in the technical scientific modules. Also, we can talk there about an integration of ethics across the curriculum in its risk and safety dimension, in its sustainability dimension, or in its legislative dimension. Um, and it's a more explicit understanding of ethics in dedicated modules, such as a first year professional formation modules or uh, engineering and management, engineering and policy modules, where we could see a broad spectrum of topics uh, being uh, addressed. And uh, another, uh, another uh, type of module, the design modules with, with their unique contribution um, to value sensitive design. So what would be the task of a program team uh, or of a program chair would be to bring all this understanding at the explicit level in, uh, in the evidence that is uh, meant to support how the program meets the outcome and also in, in the scoring and bring this understanding to, to the teaching staff. As one, uh, one instructor said, we were not aware at program level that we can count uh, uh, safety under ethics under the, uh, until the accreditation team told us so. So there is uh, an important role of the uh, members of evaluation panels also to make, uh, to make uh, program teams uh, aware of uh, all, all these uh, aspects by which ethics can be understood. Some final thoughts, uh, obtaining accreditation should not be an end in itself. Uh, it should also uh, express the program's value of continuous improvement and commitment to academic quality concerning ethics. Um, accreditation events can also be the starting point of an internal discussion about a program strategy for implementing ethics and how one can support uh, staff uh, to include ethics in their teaching and in raising awareness of the ways in which ethics is already present in their teaching, as uh, Catherine mentioned earlier. And also this is an uh, important mission of accreditation and of the formulation of accreditation requirements by which they convey to institutions and engineering programs what skills and outcomes are valued by the profession. And here we see the need for a socio-technical understanding of the engineering profession, which is manifest in the inclusion of both technical and non-technical outcomes uh, in the accreditation criteria, and also their balanced evaluation during the accrediting process. I want to thank you and uh, any questions uh, or comments would be further welcomed at my email address.